Hello everyone. In this video lecture, I'm going to highlight several key passages and present interpretations thereof in the first nine chapters of the Island of Dr. Moreau, articulating some of the central themes that are going to govern our conversation of this work. I've already suggested that this work is, is focused on the investigation and interrogation of the role of the medical practitioner and also the research scientist in society and the legitimate methodologies of research that can be justifiably employed in the pursuit of either the development of new medical techniques or just a an improvement of our understanding of both the body and the physiological processes that undergird the function of the body and the position of man in the universe in the pursuit of knowledge itself for its own sake. One of the central elements of this text that I'm going to be tracing through quotations drawn from chapters one through nine relate to the text's commentary on the nature of the human animal, whether human beings are something distinct and unique from animals, or if they are merely brute beasts that have evolved to an exceptionally high degree in terms of our intellectual capacity. One of the great questions that this text explores is one of worldview. What is the value of a human being? Is it any different from an animal or are we merely animals ourselves? Are we both animal and human as distinct categories? Or is there no ontological, no categorical distinction to be made between humans and animals? And if so, if that is all that we are, as in Dr. Moreau's perspective, when we meet him, if human beings are nothing but sacks of meat, then why should we actually care about them? Why is human suffering, pain, or the alleviation thereof a moral consideration, or with respect to the alleviation thereof and the uh, generation of human flourishing, is it a moral imperative? Is it at all? These are the kinds of questions that are intimately related to the text's commentary on the distinctions that can be drawn, if any, between human and animal. We're going to develop these themes a little bit further by analyzing sections of the text in our interactive class where I give you some discussion questions. But for the moment, I'll highlight some of those instances where in these chapters, the subject is raised. The text seems to posit that humanity is not a binary proposition with animality. Instead, humanity and animality are two poles of a spectrum we can traverse in this reflection, we're going to be looking at a series of different main points that I will then explore in relation to specific quotations from the text. So you know what we're looking towards here and what we'll be focusing on as examples of this theme of humanity versus animality. First, we'll look at alcohol and its potential to render men bestial. In other words, to bring out those uh, instinctual desires to lessen the restraints of reason that we associate with humanity. We'll examine Montgomery's servant, particularly in chapter three, and his status as an animalistic character as framed by ultimately the racist undercurrents of his connection to blackness. So throughout his description of the servant of Montgomery and his servile nature, his sloping brow and his skin tone, the narrator Prendrick of this text refers to him using the tropes and terms of racial difference and Embedded in this commentary, then, is a suggestion or the assumption of black racial inferiority. I want to make it clear, of course, that we can recognize these things as parts of the text and not embrace them. And I certainly hope that none of us do. But recognizing that these tropes are at play, I think, is an important thing to understand how this text is commenting on and developing this idea of animality versus humanity. We'll take a look at several examples of this tendency as we go on. There is also reflection on the abject and the unclean, those things that have to be cast out of civilized society. And we'll look at both Dr. Monroe, who has been uh, cast out, excuse me, Dr. Moreau, who has been cast out of civilized English society for his transgression of certain moral boundaries, and also the way in which Captain Davies seeks to excise this cancerous growth on board his boat. He indicates that Prendrick, Montgomery, and the assembled animals are this viscerally unclean thing that needs to be expelled in order to maintain the purity of his boat. But abjection is simply a term meaning the unclean and that which needs to be expelled, that disturb us and we find to be abhorrent in some way. Pus, pus is abject in that we want to purge ourselves of it and to toss it from ourselves. Something abject engenders the feelings of instinctual visceral revulsion.
and is something that is inside of ourselves or inside of a civilization or society that needs to be wrenched from it and tossed out in order to maintain the purity and cleanliness of that civilization or of our own body. That's why we try to distance ourselves instinctively from things like pus or a gangrenous tissue or even excrement. <clears throat> In keeping with this commentary on humanity and animality and those things that we have to purge from ourselves in order to maintain our humanity, we have multiple allusions to Darwinian evolution in a semi-autobiographical moment when the narrator speaks of uh, Huxley. <clears throat> this was Darwin's bulldog from the previous video lecture. Montgomery's servant then becomes a key locus for this text's analysis of humanity and animality because he operates within this liminal or interstitial position. That is a position between these two categories as the bifurcation we create between humanity and animality begins to break down. And we have this creature or this person, whatever he may be, that seems to lie between them. The narrator is constantly referring to him in terms that highlight both the, the tendencies and attributes of the animal and those of the human. So he uh, is something that cannot be justifiably or logically categorized easily. Then we'll also look at examples of how speech is treated as a motif in this piece and the way in which language is a marker not just of civility but of humanity and de degrees or categories of classes of speech allow us to position people within that much larger spectrum of humanity and animality that I mentioned. In that initial description of Montgomery's servant, we see numerous allusions to his blackness or to essentially a difference in his comportment that is analogous to a kind of racialized sentiment. Prendrick says, he was, I could see, a misshapen man, short, broad, and clumsy, with a crooked back, a hairy neck, and a head sunk between his shoulders. He was dressed in dark blue serge and had a particularly thick, coarse black hair. He turned with animal swiftness. In some indefinable way, the black face thus flashed upon me, shocked me profoundly. It was a singularly deformed one. So within the eyes themselves and within the much larger bo body, which is continually referred to as black, you have an almost complete paucity of whiteness. There's something brutish and animalistic associated with these tropes of the black man or the black person as being less evolutionarily evolved than the white, as if the shoulders that are stooping, the uh, eyes that are sunken, the excesses of hair are associated or tied to the evolutionary ancestors of the more evolved men aboard the ship like Prendrick himself. However, this brutish animality of Montgomery's servant is juxtaposed with the potential for humanity and aspirational qualities within him that we see slightly later on in the text. He has, under these brutish and superficially animalistic qualities, a certain aspirational intention and instinct, an appreciation for beauty, and a longing, perhaps, for experiences and realities that he cannot articulate and cannot even understand himself. Just before chapter 5, the narrator, Prendrick, sees this strange, deformed animal man on the edge of the ship, looking up towards the sky. He says that over the tariff rail leant a silent black figure watching the stars. It was Montgomery's strange attendant. It looked over its shoulder quickly with my movement, then looked away again. So, potentially, there's almost this strange quality of the creature or of the man, of Montgomery's servant, that allows him to look towards the stars, to look towards the heavens, to lift his eyes up from the chaotic waters around him, from the deck of the ship, from the savagery of the animals that are being transported on the deck, to appreciate the, the glittering starry hosts of heaven. So in this moment, there's this strange commingling of human and animal in him an appreciation for natural beauty and a capacity for wonder that marks us as human beings. Now, in this complex commentary on the mutability of these two seemingly distinct categories of animal and man, we also have a reflection of this liminal position on Montgomery himself, immediately prior to that moment that I just described, when we have the aspirational sense of wonder on behalf of Montgomery's servant as he looks to the stars. Prendrick learns that Montgomery himself has been cast out, has been ejected from London because of some kind of crime that he committed, 
Um, it's not made clear, but we know that Montgomery was a bit of a drunkard when he was in England and did something that forced him to flee the country. Prendrick says, to tell the truth, I was not curious to learn what might have driven a young medical student, that is Montgomery, out of London. I have an imagination. I shrugged my shoulders and turned away as he recognizes and attempts to deny and to suppress the recognition of the animal nature inside of Montgomery. I can only imagine what kind of horrible thing he must have done, what kind of violence his drunkenness must have led him to if he fled the country. So we have this juxtaposition between the servant who is superficially animalistic, but has that capacity for wonder and appreciation for beauty and Montgomery who on the surface appears noble, who has an education and is a student of medicine and biology, but also has within himself a capacity for animalistic violence, lust and desire that is made manifest by his alcoholism that we'll note at various different points here. Weaved into this juxtaposition then is the narrator Prendrick's next statement about what he can see in those fiercely inhuman eyes of Montgomery's servant. The narrator says that I saw that the eyes of Montgomery's servant that glanced at me shone with a pale green light. I did not know then that a reddish luminosity at least is not uncommon in human eyes. The thing came to me as starkly as stark inhumanity. That black figure with its eyes of fire struck down through all my adult thoughts and feelings, and for a moment the forgotten horrors of childhood came back to my mind. So, superficially, he sees in this strange reflection of light, as if the eyes themselves are capable of producing light, this red luminosity. Everything inhuman and monstrous and blasphemous, something almost demonic, that calls to mind childhood fears, fears of the dark, and of those things that we know are lurking just beyond our sensible perceptions. He has rendered, or all the manhood, all the adulthood of Prendrick is rendered away and he has left nothing more than a child waiting in the dark, sensing the eyes and the heavy breathing of a predator that is waiting for him. And yet again, even in that moment, as he sees that stark in humanity, the narrating Prendrick, the Prendrick who's looking back on these events and describing them, reminds us that now I know human beings have the same kind of speck of animality, that speck of inhumanity in their eyes, if you just look at them in the right light. It is not, in fact, uncommon in human eyes. Those forgotten horrors tie into as a species, we are instinctively predisposed to terror regarding the things that we deem to be not just inhuman, but things that we deem to be outside of our civilization, of our scope of the known and the safe. We construct a civilization or civilization arises around certain acceptable patterns of behaviors and belief. Outside of that sphere, we place everything that is abject, everything that we want to cast out of ourselves in order to protect ourselves against it. It is in that realm of inhumanity that we encounter all of our deepest, uh, that we encounter the monsters of myth and legend, those things that are excluded from society because they are unclean and they have to be cast out. Here, we see that Montgomery has undergone the same process because of some crime, some violation of the standards of decorum and an act that is so brutish and inhuman, he has to be ejected from society, cast out as unclean. He has been, well, forced to retreat from civilized society. He's no longer welcome in England. He's had to flee from civilized reprisal. Here, the juxtaposition, or indeed the comparison between the creature that is the subject of our forgotten horrors because it is outside of society, is one and the same with our abject Montgomery, the person who had to be cast out of society because he too was unclean, he too was animalistic, he too was monstrous in some way. As Prendrick is set adrift once again in his dinghy, left to die on the ocean, he thinks, he says that I felt all the wretcheder for the lack of a breakfast. Hunger and a lack of blood corpuscles take all the manhood from a man. As he recognizes at this moment that he has lost the reserve, the composure, the rationality, the ability to restrain his emotions that mark him as an evolved, respectable, civilized British man. 
we as human beings, the text is telling us, should have an ability to use our reason, this fundamentally def definitional human trait, to control our emotions and to suppress them in order to present an, a, a veneer or an affectation of intellectual reserve because of the physical circumstances in which Prendrick has found himself. Starving and for want of water and for want of hope, he has lost this these conventions of humanity, the way in which we are supposed to behave as men, particularly. Men in this civilizational context would have been, of course, expected to behave in a more well-ordered, rational, and emotionless and stoic fashion than women. Women or children may have been permitted some of the excesses of emotionalism, but not men. So his manhood has been stripped away by a lack of food and by his physical circumstances. However, this moment also serves as a commentary on the way in which human beings can be stripped of their definitional humanity. What is it that separates human beings and animals at this moment? In a way, it's the pretensions to humanity, all the structures that we have built up for ourselves, the ease and comfort with which we have access to food and uh, the means by which to satisfy all of our animalistic drives for comfort, shelter, food. Without those things, once they're stripped away, is all that's left potentially animalistic? Can the manhood of a human being be ripped away simply as a matter of circumstance? If we take ourselves out of the civilized trappings where everything or all of our animalistic needs are met so easily, is all that will be left bestial and emotional. This question of the distinction to be drawn between animal and man is couched in an explicitly Darwinian context. All of the three main characters that we meet here, Prendrick, Montgomery, and eventually Moreau himself, are scientists and biologists by training. As he speaks with Dr. Moreau, Prendrick says that I told him that I had spent some years at the Royal College of Science and had done some researches in biology under Huxley. So we hear we have this autobiographical moment as H.G. Wells refers back to his own experiences studying under Darwin's bulldog that we discussed in the previous video lecture, Huxley. He raised an eyebrow at that. That alters the case a little, Mr. Prendrick, he said, with a trifle more respect in his manner. As it happens, we are biologists here. This is a biological station of a sort. So the fact that Prendrick has trained himself and his intellect and is knowledgeable in the field of biology affords him a certain degree of respect from both Montgomery and, Prend and Moreau because he is a man like them. He's a man of science, a man of reason, a man of rationality. These things offer him a privileged position and endear him to Montgomery and Moreau. However, the fact that they are all biologists and the fact that they're looking at this through the lens of evolutionary biology couches everything that Montgomery, Moreau, and Prendrick do on this island and the experiments that we'll learn that Montgomery and Moreau are performing in an atheistic worldview. The objective of this text is on the part of the stridently atheistic H.G. Wells, to contemplate the world and the standing of human beings relative to their animality in the light of a Darwinian worldview. How do human beings differ from animals, if at all, and how should we view them and their value and worth in light of the fact that man's actions and our position in the world and our responsibilities have to be examined in light of our status as the products of Darwinian evolution? of a blind, pitiless, random process that has resulted by sheer cosmic accident in creatures that are far too intelligent for their own good, that have evolved intelligence far beyond the necessities of survival. Wells embeds in this text a, new, a number of different allusions to biblical concepts that frame Moreau himself as a kind of godlike figure. At numerous points throughout the text, Montgomery mentions that he has a hungering, a craving for meat, something that is not particularly plentiful on the island. So when he was gathering supplies for Dr. Moreau's research and experiments, he also procured a number of different rabbits. These rabbits he sets loose on the island so that they can reproduce and they'll have an endless supply of meat. When he lets the rabbits loose on the island, he says this, Increase and multiply, my friends, replenish the island. Hitherto we've had a certain lack of meat here. 
We learn that the people on this island, the individuals that Prendrick meets, are prevented from eating meat. They have to eat only vegetables and nuts. Montgomery chafes under this restriction and wants to have a source of meat for himself and Moreau. So he releases these rabbits on the island. What we have here as he does so is an allusion to Genesis 128. In the book of Genesis, which is the first book of the Christian Bible, you have through those first few chapters, a kind of mytho-historical description of the creation of the world. So if you're familiar with your Bible, the first chapter of Genesis is that famous account of creation in seven days. So you have in the beginning, the world was uh, formless and void and God hovers over the surface of the deep. And God speaks light into existence. Let there be light and God sees the light and it was good. And so through that seven day creation process on each day, God creates something new in the world. On that sixth day, he creates man and on the seventh day he rests. The command that he gives to humanity is, and God blessed them and God said unto them, be fruitful and multiply. So he tells human beings to be fruitful and multiply, to go uh, claim the earth, subdue it and take it for their own by multiplying and spreading across it. Here, Montgomery is almost assuming the position of God as he sets the rabbits free on the island and tells them to, well, replenish the island, increase and multiply. This statement on Montgomery's part is made in a sardonic fashion. However, Wells is couching Montgomery and Moreau's actions on this island in a religious context. Even though he doesn't believe in God himself, he's framing these two characters as very nearly divine. However, embedded in that divine act of creation or in this association between the two characters and God is also the reality that these two men, or Montgomery at least, have loosed on the island the forbidden fruit. In Genesis 2 and 3, you have the tale of Adam and Eve and the fall of man as they eat from the tree of knowledge, good and evil, the one tree that God said they, from which they could not eat. When they consume that, they introduce corruption and destruction into the garden. The forbidden fruit on this island, the one food that no one is supposed to eat, or at least all the people except for Montgomery and Moreau themselves are supposed to eat, is meat. Montgomery here looses the rabbits on the island and gives the people on the island, or as we'll see the creatures on the island, the opportunity and the temptation to eat of that forbidden fruit. So Montgomery and Moreau at this moment are in a strange way, both God in their association with creation and this illusion to be fruitful and multiply, and also Satan because Satan is the one who goes to Eve and deceives her into eating of the fruit of the tree of knowledge, good and evil in the Garden of Eden. As we go forward in this text, keep in mind this commentary and the introduction to these ideas about animality and humanity, how we define them, how we distinguish them, and the traits that Wells associates with each one. Also keep in mind the way in which Moreau can be perceived as a form of godlike figure on this island and what Wells might be saying about both a religious worldview or a Christian worldview and a scientific one or rather than juxtaposing religion and science, an atheistic and materialistic one based on Darwinian evolutionary theory.